Welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us, Cobalt Blue, uh, for our investment webinar. Today, we've got uh, me as your host. My name is Joel Crane. I'm the Investor Relations Manager. Uh, we're joined by the management team. We've got CEO Joe Katarevic and Executive Manager uh, Andrew Tong. The intention of today's webinar is really uh, uh, several fold. Uh, we're going to first start off by reiterating our strategy, uh, and then we're going to provide an update on the DFS, uh, as well as some of the detail on the recently announced refinery development program. Uh, and then I'll wrap up uh, the, the presentation with some comments on recent cobalt pricing and then get to the crux of the, uh, of the webinar, which is questions and answers. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Uh, this is scheduled for about 45 minutes in, in total. Um, all the participants are muted. And if you'd like to submit a question, just do so on the Q&A box in the below. Uh, I'll be moderating the questions and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Uh, thank you for those who have submitted questions uh, prior to the start. Um, but in the interest of time, of course, we'll, we'll lump some of them together. And if we don't get to them, we'll do our best to, um, uh, to come back to you in the future. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to you, Joe, if you could just uh, kick off. Yeah, thanks, Joel, and, and good morning, all. Um, let me start by reiterating, reiterating the three building blocks of the Cobalt Blue business. Um, our core focus remains on the Broken Hill Cobalt project. That's been the asset we've brought in since uh, our debut on the stock market. We now have a secondary asset in the Quinana Cobalt Refinery, which is effectively our means of taking a cobalt intermediate from BHCP and then putting that or transforming that into a cobalt sulfate for global markets. The third element or building block of our strategy is the cobalt in waste streams uh, projects. We'll have more to say on uh, cobalt in waste streams in future webinars. I just like to focus on Quinana because we're really going through an educational at the moment with our shareholder base as to what that's about and how it interacts with Broken Hill. Firstly, Quinana Cobalt Refinery is um, an unashamed view to get into the US and European markets with a battery ready cobalt product and one that will take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act and a Critical Raw Materials Act in, the, in those two jurisdictions. There's a lot of capital, a lot of focus, a lot of incentives being put by those sovereigns, and we want to take advantage of that. We've recently signed a Japanese partner uh, for that refinery. It's a partner that owns land in the Quinana area and has already permitted land for industrial use. Uh, and that's a simple fit for us to uh, put the refinery on their land. They're also a partner that's a cobalt trader and is actively looking to work with us as a, as a potential joint venturer going forward. In terms of other advantages Quinana gives us, it pre-qualifies the refinery end of the business for the global battery industry ahead of Broken Hill. So therefore it de-risks Broken Hill product by having that qualification period done ahead. Um, we're looking for first quali a qualification uh, in the back end of 25 with first production in uh, 2025 from that facility. Um, we're looking for first cash flows to our business therefore in that uh, second half of 25 period. We're also, because it's located in Quinana, we, we expect to um, have a lower cost base for that conversion facility relative to whether it, uh, if it was back in Broken Hill because of the access to lower cost reagents and chemicals in that area. It's also a deep water port. So our ability to make that product and, and put it into appropriate containers and put it straight onto a boat is greatly enhanced. I should also mention that Quinana is scalable. So our phase one, which we'll talk to in a moment, is nominally 3,000 tonne per year of metal equivalent. Uh, phase two is in line of Broken Hill Zone production. But phase one in particular is scalable depending on demand and economics thereof. And the last point I'll make with Quinana is that given its location, it gives us very strong cooperation ability with other members of the battery chain, i.e. nickel, uh, manganese, lithium. It's the only district in the world where all four elements of a lithium ion uh, cathode pass through and therefore the um, ability um, for us to, or, or the opportunity set for us to work with some of our industry colleagues is very, very strong. Uh, that's me, thanks, John. We'll hand over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Joel. I'm just going to give a quick update on a couple of slides here. The first one is just talking about the demonstration plant. 
and what we're doing out there in Breakin Hill. And then I'll move on to talking about some of the programs of work that we're doing on the refinery. In terms of the demonstration plant, uh, last time we had one of these webinars, we gave an update on some of the campaigns that we'd been doing. Over the last couple of months, we've continued to have operations out there. The broad scale of what we're trying to do from a operating philosophy to get the engineering data is to look at five to seven day campaigns where we'll run the equipment over that period of time, roughly 100 to 140 hours or so, and collect all the various engineering parameters and data from that. So I've had a series of these runs on the different aspects of the plant, the different unit operations of the plant. A lot of that data has now been uh, analyzed and compiled and then passed through to our process plant engineers, Wally, who are doing the DFS on the process plant for us. Uh, importantly, here in this photo, you can see some of the clean sulfur that we've been pulling out of the kiln section. Uh, I just thought it's worth touching on really three things from the demonstration plant, uh, which, which are worth sharing. At the high level, we're running the demonstration plant to confirm all the recoveries and the process chemistry, which we've been building up over the last few years through lab and pilot. So that phase of the work is done. We, we know the process chemically works and we know that if you do all the good bits and pieces and the parameters, you can get the cobalt out and you can get the sulfur produced. So really now the current phase of the demonstration plant is really focused on other aspects, which are really to do with DFS design and constructability. So we're really focused on materials of construction, looking at coupon testing for four or five different alloys or plastics or, or other materials that we want to use in different parts of the circuit. So we really move to materials of construction testing. We're looking at different operating philosophies. So an example of that is how do you control the process temperature to maintain that temperature? And there's many different ways that you can design that. Some are more costly, some are cheaper, some have lots of instrumentation, some have low instrumentation, some are manual, some are automated. So we're going through a series of different operating philosophy um, strategies and trying to work through what the best one is that we can take forward cost effectively into the DFS. So just trying to touch on some of these things, we've moved beyond does the process work? And we're now looking at how do we build a commercial plant using this particular uh, technology or this particular flow sheet? How do we build that? And how do we run that plant? Those are the key things that we're now looking at at demonstration plant. So my last comment is that we could stop the demonstration plant now and have enough data for DFS. However, we're quite keen to keep running the demonstration plant because it's providing really useful information, which ultimately we believe will uh, de-risk the commissioning period and help us get the Broken Hill project up and running much quicker than if we don't have this body of um, expertise and experience that we're gaining now. So we're planning to keep running the demonstration plant on feedstock from Broken Hill. And as we move to the next slide, we're now starting to also uh, build up the capability to do specific work on refinery uh, conversion of intermediates into cobalt sulfate. Thanks, Joel, for the slide. So just touching on this middle work stream pilot program, I'll, I'll give a little bit of background on that. Uh, the board and Cobalt Blue has taken the view that we're willing to spend around one and a half million dollars, give or take a little bit, specifically on this piloting work. This piloting work is different or in addition to what we've already built in Broken Hill. What we built in Broken Hill was a plant, a demonstration plant to process Broken Hill feedstock. What we're talking about specifically on this slide is upgrading and increasing the capacity of the refinery components of our demonstration plant to be able to handle and process third-party feedstock. Uh, there on the side, it says trial up to five tonnes. Uh, we have a number of potential supply agreements that we're just working through at the moment uh, to supply feed for this program. And uh, we're pretty confident that they'll uh, be able to deliver material to the plant around October, November this year. So we're currently upscaling the equipment we have a number of uh, vendor fabrication packages that have gone to market in the last couple of weeks. That equipment will be arriving in about six to eight weeks from now. We'll basically be replacing smaller tanks with bigger tanks, smaller pumps with bigger pumps, and then be able to do these larger trials of intermediates 
through that plant and be able to produce cobalt sulfate and potentially some nickel sulfate. We're using that program to be able to gain confidence to be able to better negotiate feedstocks, but obviously to overall de-risk the refinery business model to have certainty that the parameters work for those particular third-party feedstocks. If I just touch on two other work streams for the refinery development program, one is the cost study. So this is essentially an engineering cost study um, and we're aiming to have those costs together by the end of the year. Uh, in terms of the overall program, we also need to look at the permitting side of it. The permitting, we've been chatting to the Western Australian government and there's a number of different work streams going with uh, the government and the regulators there. And so all of this will ultimately come together in the early part of 24 with a cost study and confidence on the potential feedstocks and production of the product and having a view on the permitting and how long that'll take to get permitted. Uh, so that's really what I wanted to share about the refining development program and uh, happy to answer some specific questions uh, after the presentation today. Thanks, Joel. This is the last slide that I'll talk to. This slide just really brings together some of our projected timelines. Uh, as we've just been touching on through uh, this current calendar year, 2023, we're aiming to finish up both the DFS for the Broken Hill project and uh, commence complete some of those work streams I just touched on for the refinery. And then we're looking next year in 24 to be the year that we move into financing and do those FID uh, decision points. Um, and as we've presented previously, we're aiming to do the financing for the refinery uh, potentially earlier than the Broken Hill financing, given that there's different interest and, and different amounts of uh, or quantums of money required for those two different projects. And we're aiming to have the refinery, as Joe mentioned earlier in his comments, up and running in uh, mid to late 2025. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'll just wrap up here with a few comments on what's happening with the cobalt price, and then we'll open up for a question and answer. Uh, look, after a, a pretty tough year from sort of mid-22 um, to uh, mid-23, cobalt price around June started um, seeing a bit of an uplift. Uh, while that has tempered, uh, in the past couple of weeks, um, still slightly encouraging. And it's just nice to see prices come off from what's probably um, an unsustainable low. And really that was on the back of three uh, fundamentals. First of all, demand seems to have recovered. So about a third of cobalt's demand goes to electric vehicles, which is obviously what a lot of the market's focused on. Um, another third goes to an, um, traditional industrial um, type end uses. Um, and then the other third goes to consumer electronics, tablets, phones, all the sort of stuff that um, you need to have a rechargeable battery for. Now, it was that sector that's been quite weak for several quarters. Um, a lot of that it comes from the hangover from COVID when we stopped buying so many tablets and, and replacement phones, uh, but also because of the world's largest economy for consumer electronics, China uh, has been weakening. Um, of course, over the past couple of weeks, with a lot of discussion um, from Beijing that there is going to be some uh, consumer market stimulus. Uh, that meant that those who produce those, uh, those um, rechargeable batteries for consumer electronics have started restocking material in anticipation that that sector is going to recover. Uh, so you've seen um, some, some new stockpiling. Uh, second of all, uh, logistical constraints in Central Africa, where um, most of the world's cobalt in hydroxide form comes um, from the DRC. It's quite difficult uh, and a long, arduous truck route from the DRC to, um, to uh, one of two um, South African ports, where it then uh, basically gets on a boat and heads towards China to be refined further. But that's a sort of 60 to 70-day 70 70 trip, uh, which can run into all sorts of difficulties. Plus, with copper price um, certainly outperforming the cobalt price, uh, over the past couple of years, um, those mines, those cobalt mines, which are actually co uh, copper mines with cobalt as a byproduct, those producers are favoring shipping copper out ahead of cobalt. So uh, there's been just some bottlenecks in, in the world's largest export market. And finally, uh, hard to call this a fundamental, but 
um, keen commodity watchers um, over the past would know that the SRB, which is China's State Reserve Bureau or the or the organization in charge of stockpiling reserve materials, uh, announced uh, in June that they were going to buy cobalt um, just to sort of uplift that that strategic stockpile. In the past, SRB has a very uncanny ability to sort of pick the bottom of the market. They tend to buy when they believe is the lowest. And that tends to put a bottom on the price and, and other traders um, and end users stockpile ahead of that and start buying because they want to make sure there's um, not a, a lack of material if um, China's State Reserve Bureau is buying. So that's just sort of one of those hallmarks of uh, generally a bottom in the price. Just in terms of the outlook, um, there's still a lot of supply out there, supply growth, particularly from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and that should last another year or so. But over the longer term, which is obviously which we're more focused on, given that's when we'll be producing um, in, in the next decade or two, uh, supply growth is certainly uh, forecast to underperform versus demand growth. Uh, so we do believe cobalt prices will return much closer to their long term average, which is uh, about twenty seven dollars per pound versus the 17 that is trading at today. Uh, so I think there's a long ways to go uh, for pricing uh, from here although that may take another 12 to 18 months. But uh, we are, we are as, as well as the rest of the market, pretty confident cobalt pricing will return closer to longer term average. Okay, thank you all for uh, listening to our presentation. Uh, now, there's been a number of questions submitted uh, ahead of this call, which I'll start addressing now. Um, but please feel free to submit more in the Q&A box below. All right. Um, look, I've got a question here that you could probably both touch on, but I'll point to Joe first. Um, and I think this is this is the most common question. There's a lot of focus on the refinery. Um, have you changed the strategy? Ha has Cobalt Blue now much more focused on uh, WA than New South Wales? What's, what's happening, Joe? Uh, thanks, John. Thank you for the question. Look, um, I don't think the strategy has overall changed. We had always gone to the market with an integrated flow sheet at Broken Hill. So from mine all the way to cobalt sulfate. Uh, so the strategy hasn't changed on the production side. It's just we're now using two separate geographical locations. So mine to intermediate Broken Hill, intermediate to cobalt sulfate, Quinana. Um, and the advantages of Quinana we touched on, uh, on earlier. Because that's a simpler a process in terms of lower capital costs, our ability to fund the FID process is, is, is much more curtailed. Um, it also provides us the option then to upscale that to do third party product, which is what we've done, so called um, stage one of that in that slide. Um, and so, really, it's grown from the existing uh, production model, but nothing's changed in the strategy. We still want to be the preeminent producer of Australian cobalt globally. We're very much focused on the battery uh, industry as opposed to metallurgical cobalt. And we want to uh, loosen up any um, or source any other uh, sources of cobalt available domestically through that refinery or uh, other sources globally, which will make the ESG and uh, political cutoffs for those markets. So effectively, it's an, it's an evolution, if you like, of our production chain, but nothing different to the original strategy. Thanks. Um, and one that just came in. Um, so who will finance um, the refinery? Uh, will there be government assistance? Yeah, so we're looking, we're playing all the options for that. We have been marketing Quinana, um, well, it's now in the public domain, but well in advance of what we announced into the ASX, we've been marketing Quinana for partners. We, we've announced a Japanese partner, a trading house. Uh, we've been marketing Quinana into government, um, both uh, here and in, in Japan. We uh, Andrew and I will be on a plane the next three weeks to uh, progress those discussions. So that's financing. We've been marketing Quinana in terms of banks um, and their ability the modelling on the cash flow looks really good, really good for us, and will mean that it can hold a fair bit of debt if we so choose to use debt as opposed to equity. But fundamentally, we're looking for partner contributions. We're looking, we are looking for some government contributions um, and some debt, and then the, the the rump will be equity. But given we're guiding at the moment to broadly a 70 million Aussie uh, pre-construction build, there will be some working capital on top of that. Obviously, these are manageable chunks of money. I think, Joel, I'd just like to add 
a little comment to that question around where is perhaps government uh, strategy going. Uh, there's obviously a huge number of potential large scale mining style projects out of the ground through to various products. Uh, but one of the critical things that both Australian government and other governments have identified, uh, they call these midstream projects. So where does a midstream fit? And what we're proposing with the Quinana refinery is that that would be a midstream project. So it tips it into a slightly different pool of strategy and funding versus out of the ground, if I can sort of define it that way. And so one of the benefits for a cobalt blue to your previous question around strategy is by having a nice little package there that neatly fits into the midstream it's actually quite an attractive little proposition we're not saying it's separated we're saying it's very much intimately engaged with broken hill strategy but we're just saying it's a bit easier to put a little bow around that and fund that as a package under a midstream banner as opposed to tying it back and trying to fund it as a full mine uh, mine to refinery uh, fr from a strategy perspective. Well, that's right. I just have to agree with you that um, this is this midstream that you that you're talking about is really the focus on a number of governments, not not just Australia. That's really a lot of what the IRA in the US and CRMA in the EU and, and, uh, and many other jurisdictions where they're really trying to focus on where is the lack of capacity. There's a lot of critical mineral projects coming out of the ground across the world, uh, but what's really lacking is that midstream. So that's what's nice about, as you say, putting a little bow on this um, project because it's really um, front and center for a number of um, government agendas. Okay, um, and just finally, one sort of wrap up on this um, funding and the refinery. Um, Joe, will the Japanese, Japanese partners equity be just in the refinery or um, in cobalt blue as a whole? And obviously um, looking at the Broken Hill project. Okay, so there's, there's three vessels the funding could, could go into just to take a step back. The refinery project, the Broken Hill cobalt project, and then the headstock of, of cobalt blue. Um, at the moment, our discussions are really focused on the refinery uh, project. Um, that's a very, and as Andrew said, very simple, easy, digestible, quick to market. Uh, proposition. Uh, we we continue discussions with partners, the same partner and other partners with Broken Hill, the upstream, the, the, the large chunk of capital involved. Um, on occasion, we do talk about potential to take positions in the, in the company. But look, I, I, I've got to say they're not active discussions that right here and now. That's an option. Um, and we just need to tempo any expectations that at the moment, what's on the, what's on the block is both Quinana Refinery Project and the Broken Hill Cobalt Project. Understood, thank you. All right, Andrew, we're gonna pick on you for a little while. Um, there have been a number of questions specifically on the refinery development program. Um, this is obviously relatively new news. And um, if I can just use this as a summary, what you're, what you're doing is um, enhancing uh, what we already have in terms of a, uh, a metal refinery or producing sulfate, uh, but wanting to um, test other material uh, that we may be receiving from um, other parts of the world or um, within Australia. Um, so just on that, uh, where do you expect to source uh, third party material from which countries? And a uh, uh, question on the back of that, are there any countries you'd rule out? Before I answer specifically the question of countries, we need to be cognizant of the, the broad material flows of cobalt. Uh, just as we start to focus this question. As we all know, the vast majority of cobalt comes out of DRC or countries, neighbouring countries uh, to, to that area of the world. That's 70, 80% of global out of the ground, out of mining supply. So we don't want to sit here today and say, we'll never deal with those potential sources. We need to be much more nuanced than that. Um, and really what we're trying to say is that we're happy to process material that, and we have to always put that caveat, complies with the entire supply chain guardrails or framework. Those guardrails and framework are put in place by A, OEMs wanting see-through transparency on ESG. 
they're put in place by governments with see-through transparency on origin or provenance or ownership. And I won't go into the details on that, but all of those things come together. So we want to be in the business where we can guarantee to people that we are taking feedstock from company A or mine A and selling it through to end customer or supply chain B. And that entire supply chain is validated and approved by the likes of the European OEMs or the European Parliament or the US IRA Act. So with that sort of context, it actually doesn't rule out any country per se. It just means you actually need to go and validate. We need to go and validate the origin of that particular bag of feedstock. Where did it come from? What are the ESG slash governance metrics around that? And then to be able to certify that and push it down the line. So that just gives me a, a quick segue into some of the other things that Cobalt Blue are doing, not in isolation, but there's a lot of companies looking at that particular issue, both cobalt and nickel and lithium and tin and gold and diamonds and all sorts of other things, is this certification of how you actually track things. And uh, we're very much at the early stage of that globally, but there's a lot of work going on about harmonizing certification uh, you might have heard of the, the European Battery Alliance or uh, the battery certificate that's going to be given to potential EV customers and they can check up where all the, the origin of all their inputs. Those sorts of things we're engaged in um, and we need to ramp efforts up to be engaged in that, specifically now when we talk about possible feed to the refinery. So having said that long introduction, uh, obviously we would prefer to get feed to the refinery from within Western Australia because logistics is cheaper. But being at Quinana, we can take fee stock from overseas and the natural sources of that will be Africa, Indonesia, Philippines, just to name a few countries that all have um, you know, easy shipping ports to Quinana. It's unlikely, though it is possible, that you'd get material from South America and bring it all the way around. But really, Quinana, where are the easy ports? And that those are the ones that people should be thinking about as likely low cost logistical feedstocks to the refinery. Understood, thank you. Um, and with these parties, it's clearly early days, but what do you think the expectations within the agreements with some of these particular companies that will be supplying Cobalt Blue with um, their material, will they expect um, us to um, process the material uh, and then they market it or we will be marketing it like what we sort of and this is the great thing about having this development program is we can sort of work through these wrinkles but what do you anticipate the the end relationship being um look I, I we don't really know to be honest but having said that it's worth just having a little uh think about who the current owners of these of the larger feedstocks really are and what sort of business they're engaged in. So most of those parties are developing, and because cobalt's a byproduct, are developing, say, a copper asset or a nickel asset. That's their main game if you are the current owner of those potential intermediate feedstocks that we're trying to search for. Most of those groups are set up to sell those intermediates. They're not really designed to be on the other side of the cross trade to take the cobalt sulfate or the nickel sulfate and do something with that in a sense. So most of the groups that we're talking to are just looking at supply. The offtake side generally don't own the mines. So we're really looking at two different parties. One's a feedstock supply arrangement and one's an offtake or a sales agreement arrangement. There are a few parties that are on both sides of that, but they'd be in the minority. Uh, okay, just a couple more on the uh, refinery development program, Andrew. I believe you touched on this, but can you just remind us um, what is the budgeted capital cost and what's the expected uh, time allocation for the program? Sure. So we've allocated as a management team board around one and a half million dollars to complete that work. The vast majority of that is not for capital. The vast majority of that is really for people and to secure the feedstocks. So the work that we're doing is in Broken Hill, which is because we've already built this demonstration plant. However, we need to go, let's take one example, take a five-ton sample from a port and bring it up. 
It's also a high value sample, you know, 30, 40% metal content. So we've allocated out of that one and a half million budget, some funds to secure feedstocks, pay for the logistics, get it to site and so on and so on. Uh, but really the actual true capital to upgrade the facility is probably in the order of about 200 to $300,000 out of that 1.5, plus then allocating some money for feedstocks uh, and reagents and so on. And the rest of that, the vast majority is people, people time. Now, what this is from a Cobalt Blue perspective is it's just good to reiterate that that allocation of funds for people is sort of this transition period over the next six months or so of the current demonstration plant team looking at Broken Hill material. We're now saying in our budgets, we've allocated money for those people, those teams to continue working with Cobalt Blue by just moving from project A, Broken Hill feedstock to project B, refinery feedstock. So it's not a new team, it's the same team. We're just saying we're now projecting further forward the budget allowance for, for that team. Great, understood. Thanks. I think we might wrap it up on uh, questions for the refinery development program. If there's any others, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to, to any of us and we're happy to um, clear up anything that, that hasn't been um, overly clear in this session. All right, moving on to some sort of more um, top down or top down or, um, or bigger picture questions. Joe, here's a fun one. What is the current cash balance and do you need to raise soon? Thank you, Joel. Um, so we advised at the end of second quarter, the cash balance was 15 uh, million Aussie with a little change on that. Um, those of you following our story would have recognized that was broadly flat quarter to quarter. Um, and that was because we receded uh, some government monies under the CMI grant scheme. So um, looking forward, we've actually improved our forecasts in the, la in the last six months. So if I went back pre-Christmas uh, to today's forecast, our end of year position is improved because the CMI money was, was confirmed. We're better off on a number of other fronts, including R&D and other issues, which uh, are going to detail. As it stands, we'll have um, positive cash flow all the way to the back end of Q1 next year. And so we've got a quite a lengthy runway where we can contemplate a raise. Is a raise something I'm dealing with right now? No, we're gonna look forward at some stage on an opportunistic basis to do that. So we're not committing to it. Um, the other thing I would point out, overall spend, if I look at cap, uh, calendar 24, which is really what we would be raising for, um, calendar 24's budget is a fraction, it's well less than half of what we've spent this year because there's no FS on the table. All that heavy lifting, all that engineering, all that work um, ha has been done and committed. And next year, we're a much leaner team outside of any funds we need for actual construction of, of, of assets. So next year, the, the burn is a lot leaner um, and we'll look to make a decision on, on, on a raise in due course. So I hope that gives people some comfort um, and uh, I'm really happy with, with the way things are working out financially for us. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's very comprehensive. Um, here's one. Um, I think I'll point to Joe first, but Andrew, please feel free to jump in. I may do so as well. Um, back in May, I believe it was at the G7 in Japan, on the sidelines, uh, President Biden and our, our Prime Minister Albanese signed a pact between the US and the Australia and Australia um, basically uh, trying to qualify Australian primary material as the same or, or to uh, qualify as the same incentives as materials would in other parts of North America. While this uh, pact hasn't been uh, signed yet or hasn't gone across Congress expected to later this year. Um, but Joe, what do you think this proposed pack actually means for Cobalt Blue as a company? Yeah, look, I, I think um, probably if I take a step back rather than answer it on, on our behalf, but look at the industry in Australia, because we are, you know, one team here and trying to, to create an industry. Um, the compact, for those of you who want to do a bit of research, it's got the unusual name of the Climate um, Critical Minerals and Clean Energy Transformation Compact. It was signed between the two heads of state and under the undertaking that President Biden would take it to US Congress, because it needs to be ratified effectively. Um, we understand that ratification 
will be tested, and we can't obviously foresee uh, or guarantee an outcome, but we tested in November, but at this stage, the soundings that we're getting uh, are positive. So it'll be passed into law, we believe, by the end of the year. And I do stress, we believe, we don't have any you know, ability to, to, to temper that outcome. What does it do? It effectively will treat Australia as the 52nd state of the US. And I say that knowingly that there's 51, 50 states in the US, 51st state default status has always been Canada because of its integration with the US economy. This would give us effectively Canadian-like, US-like um, uh, benefits. What are those benefits? In a nutshell, these are US dollars, very large pools of capital that can be brought to bear in investment directly upstream, directly at project level, directly at the logistics of those projects, et cetera. Up until now, the IRA only affords Australia the FTA level of, of, um, uh, of agreement, which is really about uh, recognising the origin of the metals and, and the materials, et cetera. But ultimately, the beneficiaries of that current status is the consumer and the downstream, because they're the ones that get a tax credit. The change in this compact is that there'll be some genuine USD spent in the upstream at project level. So it's a game changer in the sense it's a direct in, in incentive to Cobalt Blue. It's a direct incentive to um, battery crit and critical minerals producers in Australia. So I believe I'm very positive about it, but I think we'll know more about um, its ratification, its rollout uh, later in the year. Great, thanks. Uh, we're getting close to uh, 45 minutes, and so a few more questions here. Something we haven't touched much on uh, in this, and is always a very popular question, is the uh, Cobalt and Waste Streams projects. Uh, since our last webinar, we've announced uh, a deal with Flin Flon, or Hud Bay, which owns a project um, called Flin Flon in, in Canada. Um, is this a good deal for Cobalt Blue is a question, uh, and how, how do we value the project? Andrew? Uh, yeah, I'll give it to Andrew. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, what we've ex executed at the moment is a test work agreement. So there's no, right now, there's no sort of commercial deal because the stepping stone is a test work agreement. So let's just sort of uh, put, put that comment in there. Uh, why is Cobalt Blue interested in engaging with a group like HUD Bay for this particular tales? Well, that leads to a much bigger story. If, if we're able to come up with a process, flow sheet, workable solution that ultimately reduces the acid load in those tailings, then there's the opportunity to enter into some sort of commercial deal, yet to be determined what that negotiation is. We see this as a stepping stone. If that's all successful, then it puts us in the box seat to be able to go and do similar deals on similar tailings anywhere around the world. So I don't think we should be too focused right now on the intricacies or nuance of this particular tails, like the grade of the metal or anything. It's more about the overall trajectory. Can Cobalt Blue come up with a credible commercially acceptable solution with its partner, in this case, Hud Bay, to solve some environmental problems. In this case, total acid mine drainage. Can we reduce that acid uh, generation load? And if so, then this is a great stepping stone to be able to move into that sector or that particular uh, area of our industry, which is tails, tails rehabilitation, tails retreatment. I might ask Andrew just to reiterate, what's our overall, flint flow on the side, what's our overall business model with with cobalt and waste streams, where do we want to be with it? So there's a, a couple of comments that are worth uh, just sharing on that. Uh, and these aren't in any particular order. Uh, number one is that as a company, we recognised early on because of our involvement in Broken Hill, that cobalt in pyrite is an underutilised uh, resource out there. So there's lots of it, but nobody's recovering cobalt from it. So that's sort of one point to consider why we want to move into this field, because we believe that there's lots of these uh, resources, inverted commas, uh, in, all around the world, specifically some regions more than others, where we can get into projects to generate cobalt. So that's sort of one aspect to it. The second is that as we've been developing our technology, Another area of, or line of interest is this generation of elemental sulfur as opposed to acid. So yes, there's lots of different pyrite processing technologies, 
but none of them at the moment are being run at a commercial level generating sulfur. So this moves us into a slightly different category because the world is forecast to be short sulfur as it transitions away from fossil fuels. So most sulfur, almost exclusively all sulfur, currently in the world is generated from sour gas or from uh, oil um, cracking and refining and so on. The sulfur in that's recovered and sold as elemental sulfur. So as the world slowly transitions away from fossil fuels, there's a forecast drop in sulfur paired with a huge demand for sulfur or acid as all these other critical minerals projects and other mining projects get going on that side and then also the fertilizer. So sulfur is forecast to be short. We're not saying next year, but longer term. So we believe that our technology on the sulfur side has some interesting legs. And again, generating sulfur at mine sites that are completed for their normal operation, that's a great place to move into because it's already permitted. It's already set up often with power and water and facilities. So that gives us a great stepping stone. So there's just sort of two things that attract us to look at tails. Um, that's probably enough for now, but they just give you some of the high level strategy options that we're looking at. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, like I said, getting close to time, um, I've got two more questions. One I'll selfishly take, uh, gentlemen, I hope you don't mind. Um, Glencore said this week it will consider cutting cobalt production to support prices. Do you think this is a real possibility? Uh, in short, uh, yes, uh, because Glencore has demonstrated in the past they are willing to do that. Uh, during the last copper uh, bear cycle in 2017, they shut down uh, their two large DRC projects for um, quite a while, you know, with the um, uh, taking the opportunity to uh, upgrade and put it on um, care and maintenance. Uh, but um, they've certainly demonstrated in the past they can slow um, or stockpile production in order to support prices, uh, and that's a, a company that's um, demonstrated they'll do that in the past, and I don't see why if, if they consider the cobalt price unsustainably low, um, they would do that um, in the current conditions. Uh, and finally, uh, I think a good one to wrap up on, um, I think I'll, I'll throw it to Joe. Um, where do you see cobalt blue uh, in one, three, and five years? Thank you. Um, Joel, look, in, in, in one year, I, we clearly want to be through all of the technical studies um, and have effectively uh, banked and financed uh, Quinana in that first half. Um, we want to be well on the way to a landing on Broken Hill Cobalt Project in that second half period. So effectively, um, you have the opportunity to introduce a project to the world's funders only once you've got something to say, which is typically that bankable or definitive study. That's a big year for us. We're gonna get in front of some very big name, both um, ECAs, which are export credit agencies or government, but also uh, commercial lenders. Um, I think Quinana has some very interesting potential to upscale, but I'll keep my powder dry on those comments as we learn more about the industry. But I think in terms of, the right place and right time, bringing Australian cobalt to the world and being a gateway for future um, cobalt projects within this country and the region, it's an excellent project and the profitability of the project and the numbers we're seeing are, are very, very encouraging. The biggest left field, um, I'll say on a 12 month basis uh, and one which I can't be too promissory on because we're still doing a lot of groundwork is, is waste streams. We've talked about Flin Flon, um, but we have a number of very, um, uh, promising inquiries on that on that uh, business unit for us. And it's certainly my intention to add flesh on the bone um, of that business unit to the market because that could end up being quite a significant contributor to our overall um, uh, footprint globally. And indeed, uh, to Andrew's point, the, the opportunity set is truly global for that. On a three and five year basis, I want to clearly be in production with respect to um, to uh, Quinana. I want to be as near to production as I can um, um, on, on Broken Hill. And I would, would like to have tied up a number of other opportunity sets with respect to, to waste streams in that point. So with a view strategically to more a 2030 view, um, having multiple arms of cobalt base metal um, generating projects through waste streams, um, having a refinery that's scaled to its position to be a preeminent Australian uh, refinery, um, having one hopefully that's integrated more locally as well in terms of precursor, 
and of course um, BHCP running and ticking ticking along and with its own expansion plans as well we've got a number of options with longer term with Broken Hill. Great I think that's a great place to wrap things up um, thank you gentlemen for taking the opportunity uh, we'll do another webinar uh, over the next month or so uh, we might give these guys a break and we'll focus on um, the cobalt and waste streams projects with our uh, project acquisition manager, um, Helen. So uh, until then, thank you all for joining us. Uh, and thank you, Andrew and Joe. Thank you. Thank you.